Hello, uh, I'm Richard Raffin. Uh, I've been making a few of these pots uh, for putting spatulas or pencils or anything else long and thin in. Um, and I'm about to make another out of cross grain. So I'll have a slightly closer look at these first. The main difference between these is that uh, in the central one here, the grain is running up and down, whereas these, it's across. So you can view the outer ones here as kind of long, tall bowls, if you like, uh, and they require facework techniques. This one I made um, using a skewed chisel, and uh, they were both hollowed using square uh, and scrapers, which is what you're going to see here. Now the main difference between these, apart from the, the hollowing, is much harder work going into end grain than the cross grain. Um, but you get more interesting patterns on the outside. Here you can barely see the kind of growth rings, whereas on this one um, it's ash, so it's a little bit pale. But there are growth rings running across here. It just uh, makes it a little bit more interesting. Um, added to which, I'm hoping these are going to warp. Uh, this tree was growing uh, three days ago, and it was um, uh, so as it dries out, uh, it should the grain should just collapse a bit, which means that the whole form is going to distort, which is what I'm after. So this is the blank I'm going to use. It's uh, just under four inches square, and it's going to the big shark jaws. I think they're ninety millimeter shark jaws. Uh, you can tell this is cross grain because here is the pith of the tree and I've tried to cut it fairly near. There's a little split there but that will come out when I make it round um, and it's going to be all facework techniques. So I'll rough it down as I do normally. I'm going to bring the tail stock up just because it feels a little bit safer that way and uh, just get it round first then reverse it in the chuck so I can start off as I normally do with a half inch spindle gouge rest is probably a shade high uh, just about centre height um, and I'm using just the, the nose of the tool just to the left of the nose of the tool problems with a tighter diameter like this is that as I'm roughing it down as the end grain comes round that is likely and it's ash it's really quite stringy um, it's likely to break away and I can I'll then come back here tend to use the less expensive tool, less expensive steel when I uh, rough down center work, uh, face work. So a little bit further to go if you want to see how far to go. That's that. That blank wasn't cut that square anyway. So. This end square so it sits back into the chuck, and I'm going to undercut it very slightly. You can see the light under there.
hanging over the rest quite a bit. It's quite a short tool, this one. So that can now go around. And the end has been rounded off. I want to keep that tail, the uh, mark for the center there for the moment. Right, so hold that firmly back into the chuck, and so that should run true. Yep. around a bit there with the cut because the rest could have been a bit nearer. In from the end, otherwise if I go that way it's going to chip out. on its side then rotate it slightly anti-clockwise to get a better feeling. Now so you can begin to see the kind of grain pattern that I'm going to get. That was where the pith was. And uh, this should warp quite a long way. Uh, when it does warp, we'll see what happens. Uh, I might have to put it in the microwave oven. Right, so I've got that lot done. Uh, I'm going to take a little bit more down here just so I've got a vague shape for the outside. Then I'm going to hollow it um, by hand rather than using a drill. depth hole as far as I can. Um, this one. So basically presenting the bevel of the drill into the hole and then push it in in a series of pushes. Let the rest drop out of the way. face work so uh, I can't do the back hollowing which uh, I would do into end grain so I'm going to use uh, a quarter inch deep fitted bowl gouge to get it started. This tool is 
just getting a bit flexible for that depth. So I'm going to transfer to a square end scraper. This one's uh, fairly thin. Uh, was it? Oh no, it's a bit steeper than I thought. It's about eight millimeters thick. It's under three eighths of an inch. So the rest comes up. So only the top left corner and the side are going to be in touch with the uh, with the wood. to jump around so I've got to get much more on top of the handle so I hold it near the ferrule I've got this side up against my forearm and you find that when you get right in the center you can uh, all the center up. Get rid of the What's happening there? Is, oh, the tool was upside down. That was what was happening there. happening inside. So there's a series of steps. I don't think we're going to be able to see right to the bottom any more than I can. Um, I can go the whole depth of this tool and uh, still have about uh, half an inch of timber in the bottom, about 15, maybe 20 mil if I'm lucky. I'd like a bit of weight left in the bottom. So I'm going to have my hand have the handle tucked well into my side. feel what's happening with the corner of the tool. Right at the bottom, I can drag the tool back, feel a step, and go forward. More of a cut to clear out the shade. You can almost hear people saying, why the hell doesn't he blow it out with compressed air? Uh, the reason is I don't have any compressed air. Now, even this tool is beginning to jump around a little bit, not quite strong enough. Uh, but I have a slightly bigger, heavier one here which is a one inch. Oh, and I should check the length too, shouldn't I? Yeah, that'd be all right. So I'm down to the right down as deep as I want to go, or as far as I can go, and I want to go in um, straight or even slightly back a little bit, so it's very slightly wider in the back, in the bottom. Apologies if I was in the way. And 
just see how we're going down at the bottom with some internal calipers. Looks quite a bit narrower. So I can take nothing at the top and half that width on the right as a, as a cut and that will give me a cylinder. recess on the bottom so now I need to get that bottom step out and basically feel in there with the scraper at the bottom pull it back feel where the step is and then go forwards gives me a uh, pretty smooth inside. We'll see how we're going with this. Right, and the reason you have expanding calipers and if it's wider at the back you know how much wider and it is very slightly wider at the back, which is what I want. Now I can get rid of the little ridges from the uh, corner of the scraper using a, uh, a gouge. Uh, this, the quarter inch spindle gouge, um, quarter inch bowl gouge is a bit spindly, a, a bit too thin. So I'm going to be using, this is a, a detail gouge, um, a half inch detail gouge, really spindle detail gouge. And that will just about get me to the bottom. And so I'm going to be across here uh, again I can't see what I'm doing I can watch the first bit of the cut progressing at about four o'clock down over there but otherwise it, it's a you've got to feel the whole thing so it's all start on the side get it in you feel it starting to cut smooth cut uh, all the way down and I've just got about another inch and a half to go about another 35 mil and I am down to a depth of uh, 150 millimeters which is six inches Just need to feel where that is. Yep, I can feel that. Let's get the 
last bit into the corner. Now the rest comes up so that I can then use the one inch scrape. It's got a slight radius on it so hopefully I won't have too big a catch if I have a catch at all in the bottom. And the idea is going to be to sweep that corner up through centre and then out to the left. Pitched down slightly so I'm on a flat surface. Right over the tool. actually have a blower, uh, a vacuum, so I'll just blow that out. Inside here there are some very broad chatter marks. If I run my fingers over it, um, it's not really chatter marks so much as I didn't go in smoothly enough, so I've got a series of bumps. Um, mostly because I wasn't right behind the tool, trying to stay out of the way of the camera. So what I'll do is Put the camera the other side and um, try and get down there with a, with a final cut with the gouge going through these bumps and across the little dips. The rest now uh, below centre. should be five times the length of the overhang. Right, so I've got a clean cut to within about 20 mil of the bottom. millimeters of the bottom so I'll get rid of that with the uh, slightly skewed square end scraper. So it just needs a little bit more doing for the last inch and it's easy to do that with a corner of the scraper. Nope, doesn't sound right. Now I can sand that. 
And I do that with a sanding stick. So I have a dowel with a, a slit in it. That will deal with that. Now in this case, still just the. Uh, it's not too much. Uh, it'll it'll need a bit of um, probably 80 grit to start with, then 120. So I'm not going to bore you with all that on this occasion. So I'll get sanding this, and I'll come back and finish off the outside. So the inside's done. Uh, sand it, but not oil, because this is green timber. Um, there are a few little splits coming there, which is a bit alarming. Um, but the aim now is to put it between centers. So, as not to uh, stain the wood, I'm going to uh, put some of this non-slip cloth around inside the jaws. And the advantage of this is that it will slip, it will stretch a little bit. So that goes in there. Pull that in tight. That goes over there. Now, I don't want the rim all the way up to the chuck because I'm going to be um, working or turning all of that. So just get it lightly fixed for the moment. And then the reason I kept the center mark originally was so that I can locate center easily now. Now this tightens up. This is a homemade uh, scraper. It's out of an old three-quarter inch uh, square inch scraper and uh, just done on the corner of a CBN wheel. And I'm going to bring the tool up into the cup. Get it slightly sideways. Probably risk one more lot before it gets thin. And that will be sufficient. I need to put some down here, but I don't know. Right, so that now gets sanded. Um, and that's it. And you begin to see the kind of nice big growth patterns here, growth rings. And very irritatingly, there is a split just there. And uh, given that, I'm going to risk another line of grooves. Hopefully if that opens up, it won't be that noticeable. I'll just touch that up with, uh, I finished this with um, the blue, the 240 grit. Quite fine enough for anything like this. Right, now coming across the bottom, um, this remember is face work. It might be long and thin, but it's basically the grains across. Uh, and when it warps, because the... Uh, pith of the tree was pretty well there. The whole thing's going to bend that way. There's more moisture in here So when that dries out, it's going to pull the whole shape that way Which means that the bottom might end up not being flat uh, And if that's the case uh, I'd have two options one is to sand it flat on a on a belt sander or a disc sander um, but if I undercut the bottom a bit 
uh, then I can cut away most of it and leave three little feet. Uh, and so I'll leave myself with that option. Use the wing of the tool first just to shear scrape that edge. That tailstock just went round a little bit. That's it. Now I know it's supporting some wood. And right on its side at the end of that cut. Now, of course, the grain's running across. Um, I can, oops, I better sand it first. Uh, a little bit of 240. Pretty good cut across there. A little push here, the, the grain will virtually shear. So I can go almost there, turn the lathe off and at the last minute just give it a little shove. That should, do, should just come away. That's it. A little bit of hand sanding that's done. And that can now dry out and uh, I will see what happens to it over a couple of days. I could put it in the microwave, but um, just leave it like that for the moment. So here's my collection of pots uh, about 18 hours later. Uh, I've put each of these through the microwave uh, about four times at 90 seconds a time. Each time they came out uh, almost too hot to handle, um, and so they're being distorted uh, quite nicely. I uh, don't think they'll do much more than this. Uh, but this, for instance, has gone from uh, 65 millimeters to 61, and uh, the bottom is uh, hasn't moved quite as much. That's 73 to uh, 76. Taller one, again it's gone 55, 51 rather to 54. Uh, even the end grain one with the grain running this way has distorted a little bit, it's gone uh, almost D-shaped. So across there it's 50, sorry, 47, and across there it's about 48. No, it still looks Yes, I've got to be able to find a, small, a bigger difference somewhere in there somewhere, but it has distorted anyway. Looking like a bit of old bone now. And this one, as you can see, has started to bend out there. And gone slightly D-shaped, so that's 62. Only 62 at the moment. Um, but mostly what I was after was a bit of a bend. Now, I quite like to see these kind of pots as sculptural groups. Uh, if I do a fair number of them and my pots tend to get the verdigris treatment so they end up looking rather like this some of them get extremely wacky so that's rusty and verdigris as well and we have a couple of little shorter ones There's that one and these little baby ones as rust and these are painted on the inside with acrylic and they will be the topic of a separate video at some stage <laughs>